Otters volcanoes, like this one in Mexico, or this one in uh, Indonesia, have to do with Vikings and with uh, Ragnarok, the end of the world. Well, I'll tell you in this video, and it's quite intriguing because we are then m moving really into the, this mythological landscape and uh, the legendary times before the Viking Age. Uh, it's quite cool, and um, it's got a lot to do with um, legends like this one on uh, Surtr, um, who brought the fire that would engulf all of Earth after fighting with the gods. And he was himself a Jotun, which also were gods in a sense. And um, in this video, I'll use a, um, uh, an, an article that came out by some researchers in uh, uh, many different universities around in Oslo. But it's, it's quite cool. And I'll put a link down below as always. And, and uh, here you can see how Fenris, the um, wolf, eats the sun. And there's this, this depiction of something grave that happened and influenced so many generations for centuries on, on afterwards. And they're trying to remember this from a time period when so many people died and, and memories also disappear in a, in a sense. And, and it's, it's really intriguing to think of it's even more intriguing to, to read. And I'll read you some also and put some of my aspects to this. Um, the winter called the Fimble winter is coming. That's the winter for three years, right? Snow flies from everywhere. There are strong, cold and sharp winds. This is what Snorre wrote 800 years ago. No living thing that enjoys the sun. There are three such winters without summers in between. And that's what Snorri wrote in his book, Edda. All Norwegians, they know about this. And the thing is, this really happened. The long, harsh Fimble winter is not a myth. And that's uh, the basis of this article. And I, I'll give you my viewpoint on this in this video. And um, they also talk about this uh, professor, Frode Iversen in, uh, in Oslo, that there was this massive de uh, devastation of farms in, uh, in, in Norway. And we've known about this, but why did it happen? And so suddenly also, um, uh, for instance, uh, this other researcher here, he talks about the decline in discovery sites in this period from before and after the year 550. Uh, so this is some time before the Viking Age, right? Um, uh, the decline is, uh, is so much as 70% in, uh, for archaeologists, the discoveries. And, and this, despite the fact, this says here, that the Merovingian period lasted 100 years longer than the period before. And, and there is a, uh, a lot of different things here that uh, uh, is difficult to grasp for many. We don't have too many sources either. But there are some with DNA even now. Um, and then came the plague, because there was this volcanic eruption in the year 536, and then another in the year 540. I'll show you how devastating it was now. And then this Justinian plague comes, uh, which had the same bacteria as uh, um, Yersinia pestis, the Black Plague, that came uh, 800 years later in the 14th century. And, and uh, as you can see here, uh, in Italy, how it's reported, a sky full of dark clouds and sunlight lasting just a few hours a day and a constant solar eclipse and, uh, and uh, lots of famine. And that's, um, that's what we know. We also know that the art of goldsmithing disappears in, in Norway with jewelry. Uh, fine gold and silver jewelry were less common. And some of the jewelry uh, was made, bit, well, became simpler, looking almost homemade in a sense. Uh, I'll show you here a, a pearl uh, that's found in Norway in the years preceding, because I, I, I'd like to give you a larger perspective. Let's start there. This pearl was probably made in Constantinople in present day Turkey. And, and um, they even had um, jewelry coming from as far away as um, uh, Sri Lanka, present day Sri Lanka and India and the shells that they used in the jewelry from the Indian Sea or the Red Sea, but it's, it's like really, really far away. And in Scandinavia, we had a lot to trade with. So I, I just want to give that larger picture. And then you come to the burials here, they were really rich and then it all stopped. And, and this is quite uh, intriguing to me because this is called the Dark Ages. 
of Europe. It's been called that. And of course, this was a concept that came much later on um, in, in Italy. And, and it had something to do with the end of the Roman Empire, of course. Um, but let me show you something here now, um, because we also talk about the Fimbul winter. This winter lasted three years. And the thing we need to remember is that these things that happened, not just this one decade, 536 to the 540s, but in the preceding decades, there has a preceding, the later decades, uh, like the 125 year mini ice age that links uh, both the plague and the fall of empires uh, together. And, and they, found, they find this, uh, one thing is that the climate got a lot cooler and everything stopped growing for a period, but that, that it lasted 125 years, well into the middle of the seventh century. And uh, as I point out in my other video on um, did the Viking Age start uh, or last 1,000 years, uh, there's this discontinuity here. And it makes it really hard for us to look back through this time period. It's like looking through distorted glass and then piecing together this sort of like mosaic, uh, like a puzzle to try to find out what really happened. And that's the thing with legends. And, and they had um, and this mythology, uh, it's written Many centuries later, even after the Viking Age, it was a very strong oral tradition, of course. They remembered far and had all these poems and everything. But still, it's really, really hard. And I want to show you this map here, as you can see how the Germanic tribes would wander around in, in, in Europe and settle in different places. But a lot of it, this had to do with trade. And when the trading routes uh, disappeared, the market disappeared because people would die, basically. Um, and so many farms were, were uh, depopulated. Um, did that do something for these people who survived? Did they travel somewhere else and settled? And we, we do find, as you can see here, um, the trading patterns I talked about and, uh, with the Amber Road also. It was very important to the Roman Empire, but there was a lot of other stuff that came down from Scandinavia and was traded. And the question is, um, if you see this map here of the strong um, central settlement regions in the Roman Iron Age and the migration period. So these are the centuries before all this happened in the sixth century. And I, I pointed out this trading route across Sweden here, which is quite important because it connects connects to this um, amber route going down to the Roman Empire at the time. And this all stopped. And my question is, all right, do we see in this old um, Scandinavia here, do, do we see, uh, we see actually some proof of DNA in, in the DNA that there has been migration into Scandinavia from the south. I was part of that paper, the Viking paper from last year. And um, I, the question is, do some, uh, who was it who came back? We know new trading routes would emerge, especially in the seventh centuries and the sixth, uh, sorry, the seventh and the eighth centuries. Um, and the, the, that's when the Franks grew because uh, the Anglo-Saxons had established themselves in England. They were also Christian and had, were closely related with the Franks. And it grew, and, and as I made a point out in this video on what started the Viking Age, this all caused something new in the um, 8th uh, century. But as you can see here on this map of Scandinavia, in the middle or in the southern Sweden there, you'll, you'll see Herulir. And, and um, uh, some people talk about the strong connection that the Herulir down in the Balkans, this Germanic tribe, had with Scandinavia. Uh, Lotte Hedager, this uh, famous archaeologist in uh, Scandinavia, she talks about the Huns who might have settled there in southern Sweden and, and makes a very sound argument that something happened. And we also see in terms of jewelry that uh, instead of getting jewelry from far back, and now we're talking some decades after when things started to pick up again, in the seventh century, um, we see mining for, for the same kind of jewelry, but uh, uh, in uh, present day Sweden, in Uppsala, and also in Norway. 
so it's traces of new industry emerging and, and even uh, sort of like industrial scale production of whetstone in Norway and, and that was being sold all over Scandinavia uh, much before the Viking Age in the very start of the 8th century. Uh, so, so that's when things started to pick up again and these new trading routes, everything centered more uh, towards the Franks, what became um, France, Italy and, uh, and Germany and also England, of course. You can see my video, my other video about that. But it's, it's really, really intriguing. And, and this whole um, European Dark Ages, this transition period that it was, it's, it's quite cool to think of. Check out the runes, for example, how much they changed in this time period. This is the S rune, it's the Sigma uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the ancient Greeks, uh, which is, was adapted from, which again was adapted from the Phoenicians, um, one believes. Sigma meaning, meaning uh, sun. And in, um, then we come to Ragnarok, because this has something to do with Ragnarok and how people remember a terrible period Lots of people dying, everything toppled upside down and, and something new emerged. And there's a parallel here, I'll talk about it very soon, um, uh, with the Black Plague and what happened afterwards. So in Ragnarok, it's very, very well described. It's fascinating, really, in Vulusbo, for example, um, which uh, in the Eddas. And here you can see it's... Um, it uh, sates itself on the lifeblood of fated men, paints red the power's homes with crimson gore. Black becomes the sun's beams in the summer that follow. Weather all treacherous. Do you still seek to know and what? And it's this whole thing they want to know about knowledge and, and what happened in this uh, period. And, and I, I can move on here. This is from Wulluspo. Brothers will fight and kill each other. Sisters, children will defile kinship. It is a harsh, it is harsh in the world. Hordom rife, an axe age, a sword age. Shields are riven, a wind age, a wolf age, before the world goes headlong. No man will have mercy on another. And this has inspired a lot of paintings that you can see here and the, the writings itself. I put links down so you can see, go in and read, uh, for example, how the Aesir and Odin with his Einherjar dress up for war and go to the field and, and uh, with his spear and his riding and advancing against Fenrir the wolf while Thor moves at his side and, and uh, down further below here, uh, the hound Garmr breaks free from his bonds in front of Gnipa Helir and fights the god Tyr, resulting in both their deaths. And Thor kills Jörmund god Gander, uh, the serpent, but he's poisoned by them at the same time and manages to walk only nine steps before falling to the earth dead. And listen, Fenrir swallows Odin, though immediately afterwards his son revenges him, you know, he, that he keeps his, his foot into Fenrir's lower jaw and grips the upper jaw and rips part Fenrir's mouth, killing the great wolf. And, <laughs> you know, it's so interesting, I think, to see all these uh, depictions coming out of this uh, from uh, uh, the, the artwork uh, of uh, Vidar, for example, with, uh, with, with the great wolf. Uh, and, and of course in the movies and uh, um, it, it's just really intriguing to see how much this has been sort of like um, inspirational. But what about afterwards? Because this is the thing, most people don't think about this. The Vikings knew of course so well about Ragnarok and the end of the world, but it had happened in the past. You know, there were survivors here. And it didn't happen in the past, and there were survivors, and a new world rose after Ragnarok. And even humans, what about the humans? Well, uh, first of all, the gods, they met on Ida uh, which is the place where they had uh, altars and temples, it's a place of worship. There's still several places in Scandinavia called Ida um, And I know one in particular, which is my favorite, and there, um, it's a very, very religious place of the old. 
And as you can see here, the surviving gods shall meet after the catalyst, uh, the, the events of Ragnarok. And, and there, um, the, the, um, uh, it says here, uh, the gods who survived, Hörne, I know, Vidar, Vali, Balder, and Hörder, they reemerged from the dead and, and shall dwell at Idavaller. And the sons, the two sons of Thor, they, Magni and Modi, they received on Idavallen after Ragnarok their father's hammer. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's really, really cool. And what about the humans? Well, um, just like with Adam and Eve and Ask and Embla in the Norse mythology, you also have um, Liv and uh, Liftrasir who survived Rang Rangarok. And they survived by uh, hiding close to Yggdrasil, the great tree. They found this cave called uh, Hödmimis Holt. And uh, that's where they survived the long winters of Fimbulvetter. Uh, but also Ragnarok, it's all connected. And I think this is important to know when we try to remember an actual historical event and its aftermath and how much it creates in uh, so many different uh, peoples, groups of people um, in, in the common recollection of the past. And, and, and here we also find this Germanic fascination for, for, for trees, you know, like Mima Meider, uh, which is, uh, has branches going wide, is unharmed by fire or metal and bears fruit that assist pregnant women. Hmm, imagine that. And, and uh, it's connected also with the refuge that they had, these two uh, humans during Ragnarok. And Mimis Brunner, that's a well, uh, also at the same place. Uh, and this is also the well that Odin sacrificed his one eye for wisdom. And, and uh, imagine that how, how important wisdom was uh, for the Vikings. It was sought after as a trait, you know. Um, it couldn't be a man or a whole person without knowledge. So I think this with Ragnarok, it's uh, so intriguing to think of from so many aspects. And I've experienced these stories as a child, as a young uh, or as a youth, and later on understanding more about uh, life history and, and how everything is not black or white. Um, it's really, really fascinating. And then I'd like to say something on, on, on the plague, because one thing was this climate catastrophe that happened, but the Justinian plague that came right after there was this earthquake in 540, right? In 541, you had an outbreak of the most horrible, deadly disease. Um, but I'm a little bit puzzled because uh, from Max Planck, uh, actually, um, three, uh, two, two years ago, two and a half years ago, the, the, there is this research group who claims that the Justinian plague maybe wasn't a landmark uh, pandemic. It wasn't so uh, uh, horrible or, or uh, devastating as some maybe have um, thought about, and I'm one of those who thought about that. So I'm a little bit um, curious about that uh, because it uh, it's almost like you would think it would contradict because you see so much happening after this climate event from these volcanoes erupting, right? Was it only the volcanoes that caused this for 125 years? Or did plague have something to do with it also? Was the plague more severe in certain places that made people migrate back to Scandinavia, for example, since they had connections with Scandinavia? That could very well be. So, um, well, I'm waiting for more research yeah, and talking with more people. And now let me do this thing with the Black Plague, because eight centuries later, we had the Black Plague, and this is from Kittelsen, uh, very, Theodore Kittelsen, very uh, famous painter from, uh, um, oh, he's long since passed, but his depictions from the Black Plague, but also from trolls, by the way, uh, this mythical, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special place in the mythical uh, hearts that we all have. We all have a sp uh, place in our hearts for this. Uh, I guess it's a little bit romanticizing, but it's this mythical past. And, and um, the Black Plague, you know, this is the reason why um, we have surnames in Norway called Ødegård, like the Real Madrid uh, 
uh, football player, soccer player, on uh, now playing in uh, in Arsenal. Uh, that means desolated farm, Ödegård. And it's from this time, because so many farms were, were, were desolated. And the language changed, also the English language. You know, they started having diphthongs. In Norway and Sweden and Denmark, we, we stopped having the uh, language that you have on the Faroe Islands in Iceland now, with the uh, nominative, accusative, dative, and genitive, and the, the endings there, like they still have in Russia, for example. And, and, um, and so language has changed even more after these um, devastating years. And uh, a house and a boat in English was before the Black Death uh, or the plague in the 14th century. Uh, it was hus and bot, just like in present day Scandinavia, right? So, so things changed. And, and uh, I think there are some parallels here in history and we can see this uh, when, when uh, for instance, the nobility, the Norwegian nobility uh, from the old times at the start of the Black Plague. So many people died and we lost, in a sense, all power. Uh, the Hanseatic League uh, took over the trade. These were Germans uh, controlling lots of trading routes and cities, uh, especially in Norway, with, because of all the fish and the dried fish. And, um, and uh, the, then the new Danish nobility came in and started this 400 year long winter, as we call it, uh, in Norway. And they married, as with the Vikings, they married into the local uh, aristocracy. But there was much left of it. But not, not all did, did this, because a lot of, um, we even see it in surnames, like in, uh, in uh, Myklebust, which is uh, Mikkelbostad, big place. Uh, those are descendants from the old nobility. And, and in Norway, a lot of the old nobility actually went down into becoming farmers and and. Uh, and um, we know this from so many places up along the coast. Uh, so you can, you can actually see how some of the nobility uh, would assimilate downwards in a, in a, in a sense. And, and the, that made for us in the 16th century, we have a, some we have really uh, literate uh, farming community all around in Norway because of this and with strong ties to the past, which I think we still have, at least where my family comes from on, on Sundere. It's like there are some roots here that have been strengthened because of this. I find that fascinating. So um, let's finish off here with some uh, volcanoes. So this is the uh, Chichon, uh, the volcano in Mexico. And um, uh, here you can see this research uh, paper on how it disrupted so much in the sixth century. And this was the one that uh, exploded in 540. Uh, but in 536, you had the, the other volcano also. Uh, I think in Mexico, it's the number 21 there. Uh, if anyone wants to go see the volcano, can, of course. But then you also have in Peru. I wanted to talk about that also because volcanoes have, have affected the descendants of Vikings in, in, in other ways also. And in the year 1600, the, the volcano is called Huyana Putina. Huyana Putina. Uh, I'll... I'll Let's say that is good enough, uh, the pronunciation, but you can see the volcano here. And uh, uh, that volcano was so devastating, it caused global disruption uh, And uh, in the year 1600. And up until then, there was one ruling family in the, in the countries, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, what became Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. And, Russia. and that was the Röriks, the original Viking clan. Right, and imagine that it was a volcano in Peru that stopped their demise because it brought the worst famine in history of uh, of of, uh, of Russia, with uh, a third of the population, two million people died uh, from this, and that caused uh, or set the um, scene for the Romanos. Romanos to come and take over. And at the same time as this happened in Russia, uh, they had such a large problem with slavery. With, with millions of people from, from all around north of uh, the Black Sea being um, abducted into slavery and sold uh, through the Crimean Khanat down to the Ottoman Empire. And it wasn't until Katarina the Great in the 18th century were able to stop this effectively, uh, causing more rise to, uh, to, to, to Russia, of course. 
And, and, uh, and this paper is quite cool because uh, in a sense it says every 200 years we see some kind of big uh, volcanic eruption. So I guess it's about time uh, now soon or something happened in, um, in Iceland uh, not, not so long ago. So maybe uh, some more things uh, are about to happen. Uh, well, in, in the year 1816, uh, there was also a big eruption, the year without summer. And that was also in the Indonesia, another eruption. And uh, we, uh, let's get back to Krakatoa, this, um, uh, this volca volcanic eruption or this volcano. That's um, the, the root, I guess, of so much artistry. And Krakatoa also had a huge explosion, eruption in 1883 and 1884. And that's how the painting scream by the Norwegian painter Edvard Munch came about because uh, he wrote down in his diary his inspiration for this and he was walking up uh, in uh, Oslo uh, close to Ekeberg there and he saw the whole sky turn red from this for several days on and that's that's the painting <laughs> you know it's that's the inspiration for the painting and I, th I find that fascinating and and also on Iceland this is rather new uh, they found the secret cave where nobody has been in for centuries on where uh, there was a huge eruption in this area 1100 years ago and that created this cave and and the, these uh, early arrivals this was just after the first vikings had settled in on iceland they would go down into this cave and they would build as you can see here a massive boat there and have apparent rituals there also and and uh, and we know this probably because when christianity came uh, nobody went to the cave anymore apparently so then it was um, left alone for centuries so it's a really cool find. And uh, I'd like to finish off now uh, by, by looking at this article again, where they talk also about Sweden, how, how much um, that happened after this incident in 536 and 540 also, um, with, with uh, a large number of Swedish farms uh, being abandoned. And the northern part of Sweden, Norrland, that used to be so rich only a century and two before where my may have been completely depopulated it says here and and half of swedish farms abandoned another researcher uh says here in certain areas and uh, raknehaven you know i made a video about this big uh, the pyramids of the north i call that video well in raknehaven um, this is an actual timber log from there where you can see the white you can see how it grows right uh, the growth rate and this uh, log uh, was put in this um, mound in the year 541 and uh, probably cut in the year 541, 551, sorry. And then you can see and read and the new thing now they're doing this research project, which I think is quite cool. They're using new technology so they can see what the temperatures were week by week in the year 536 and subsequent years. And this uh, project, they have the research project at the... Um, um, well, in Oslo, but it's uh, multidisciplinary and also involving a lot of people, uh, volcanic eruptions and their impacts on climate, environment and Viking society. That's um, they're expecting. It's been a little bit postponed now, I've heard, uh, because of COVID-19, but they're expecting a lot of papers to come out, and especially in 2023, uh, when the project will finish off. And then we'll know even more about this, I hope. I'm looking forward to that, and I'll keep you updated. So I hope this was uh, an OK uh, take on uh, the uh, Fimbulwinter. And, and the way I picture it, that Ragnarok had already happened, and some survived. And this, the way to have this as a remembrance, as a, um, uh, a part of your mythology, uh, an inspiring art, in the sense, and 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 uh, the way they told stories in uh, uh, around bonfires about this for centuries on, just amazing to think of, you know. So uh, I hope you like it. Um, I hope you like the shirt, Hell on Earth. I think some of you have seen this shirt before. Uh, I thought it was fitting for today, and. Uh, I'll release this video now. I hope it turns out well. I'll put some graphics on. And um, I wish you a good uh, weekend and have a good time. Take care.